Good afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Daily French Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer, and I'm joined today by Mr. Marius Root. Marius, how are you? I believe you're in Cape Town. You fled the East Rand. Why is that so? Uh, yeah, uh, how's it, guys? And I just, uh, my father lives down here, so I just came to have a look and considering uh, uh, maybe moving abroad to Cape Town. So I uh, just come to have a look. So yeah, I've just been here for a couple of days and back in Joburg on Sunday. And Sherlin, you are also joining us from Cape Town. Sherlin, how are you? I'm doing good, Nick. And I'm just happy that Marius decided to come and visit a first world country down in the Cape. <laughs> um, I hope he enjoys his stay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into the news. So the most important thing I think today uh, and tomorrow is the release of the matric results across the country. Uh, tomorrow we're getting the majority of schools in South Africa when we, then the government uh, exam system releases its results. But the Independent Education Board or the Independent Examinations Board, rather, uh, the IB, released its results today. And unsurprisingly, it did very well, as it almost always does. Um, you know, if one was asking the question, how do I pass my trick? It seems as though the answer is to go to an IEB school. The matric pass rate for IEB schools was 98.42%, which is, of course, very good. And of those, uh, of those people who passed, just under 90% achieved a bachelor's pass, which is the sort of highest level of pass that's uh, recorded. Um, and this is despite the fact that the grade 10s and 11s who this year, who, who, whose results this were, um, they, they went through COVID um, at the absolute worst time, of course, they would have been going into grade 10 uh, just as the pandemic hit. And your curriculum for matric is, it begins in grade 10 and it finishes, obviously, when you matriculate. So this meant that they had to adapt very quickly to the conditions. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of online learning. Uh, uh, the, and, and, and despite all of this, the results are actually very slightly up from last year when they were um, just around, just under the 98% uh, last time, and 98.4% last time. So um, I guess the question is, and uh, Morris, let me start with you. Why is it that the IEB schools were able to weather the storm of COVID and achieve such a great result? Yeah, well, I think uh, it's also a big question of resources. Most schools that write IB exams, probably the vast majority are, uh, you know, probably all of them are going to be very well resource schools. Uh, people who go there are going to probably come from mainly middle class families. They're going to have access to the internet. You know, probably online learning wasn't such a big problem for a lot of people. Of course, you'll lose a lot of the kinds of things that you get from face to face learning. I'm sure a lot of people who go to IB, I, or most people who went to IB schools, uh, uh, up, as I say, have access to internet and laptops and all that kind of thing. So this disruption was probably a bit, uh, you know, not as uh, hectic as it was for in people in, say, you know, uh, more poorly resourced schools and so on. Where I think was that was a real blow to learning uh, in the last two years. You know, if somebody goes to a school in Lusigi Sigi, where, you know. No, no, nobody's parents are employed, the school probably doesn't electricity or whatever you, you know, people who live in those, those kind of areas aren't going to have uh, internet or uh, have laptops and so on. Obviously, through no fault of their own, I mean, there won't be, uh, you know, opportunities for employment and so on in a place like Pelusigi Sigi. So I think a lot of it does come down to uh, simply a question of resources and, you know, IEB schools are probably going to be uh, also pretty well staffed and so on. So I don't know if uh, IEB is, um, you know, if... Uh, we had to look at it like it's a better kind of uh, run organization than when it comes to exams and say the GDE, but I think it's definitely a question of resources and so on. But uh, I did some research a couple of years ago and I looked at matric results broken down, uh, and this was for government schools, uh, broken down by former Model T schools in schools that were under the old Department of Education and Training, which was uh, obviously black schools and also uh, schools that were reserved for colored and Indian people uh, in the old days. And if you broke uh, those results down, uh, the uh, matric results for uh, former Model C schools were obviously not as, uh, were, while they weren't as um, impressive, uh, impressive as these IB results, they were still pretty good. Uh, most Model C schools get um, 
you know, pass rates of 80 to 90 percent. Some get 100 percent. You also get pretty good bachelor's pass rates. And also looked, I broke this down by race. And while black kids uh, uh, most of the time didn't have uh, pass rates or uh, bachelor pass rates as uh, high as uh, uh, white white pupils and so on, they were still much higher than the kind of results they were getting in uh, former blacks only schools. So, and I think that's also comes down to a question of resources. Even say somebody who maybe comes from a poorer background, but they're attending a Model C school, they're going to have better support in the school. They might say uh, there might be more opportunity for bursaries. There might be some kind of program where they can have access to a laptop that they can buy from the school or whatever the case is. So I think a lot of this simply comes down to resources and so on. And I think we'll see, you know, uh, while, while South Africa is in its current economic state, we're going to see these kind of uh, edu educational outcomes from, you know, from uh, many government schools and so on. So, yeah, it's all, it's, it's at the end of that, it's uh, often a question of, uh, you know, resources, economic resources, and while we're in the current situations the, of this country with the, you know, low chain and all that kind of thing and probably economic growth about 1% this year, unfortunately, that's not really going to change. Yeah, it looks like a lot of the schools that did really well in the, uh, a lot of the IB schools are the Kiro schools, um, which mm -hmm. can cost, I think this year, something around 82,000 rand a year for someone between grade 10 and the trick, um, which is quite expensive, but not as much as I think some of those other you know, the, like the old fashioned uh, the sort of boys boarding schools or girls boarding schools, that kind of thing. Um, Sholem, what do you make of this? Uh, you know, what lessons can the rest of the education system, do you think, learn from our IB system? I mean, I think resource is definitely part of it. And obviously not every school in the country can be as well resourced as some of the IB schools. But it's not just about resources. It's also about, I think, how you spend that money. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that, Nick. I mean, this the results are obviously no surprise. Um, maybe it is a surprise because of COVID and all of those things. But I think we've consistently seen this type of performance um, for um, IEB schools, private schools. And I think it also comes down to um, some of the things Marius mentioned, um, you know, that private schools tend to be, you know, they, better, they have better facilities, um, staff. I think there's an uh, accountability mechanism that, is there's a culture of accountability in um, private schools um, that I think is lacking, at least from my experience, um, as going into a public school um, where parents tend to be way more engaged, um, holding teachers accountable for the performance, um, the senior staff. I think that is crucial. And I don't think, and I think it's overlooked at times. Um, I, with this, Nick, I, the results just came out um, today, or was it yesterday? And I've already seen... No, I think it's today. Um, was today and i've already seen comments of people like saying you know what this just goes to speak to the inequality that exists in south africa's education system and so forth and while many of these critics are so focused on the success um of the private schools um nobody is is actually speaking already in expectation about the failures of the national government and how they are dealing and provincial government as well governments um, dealing with how public schools are actually run. Um, I also think that, yeah, resources. Um, South, Africa, South Africa's government does spend a lot of money on our public schools. So I don't necessarily think um, if the amount of money is the problem, but I think the way it is managed through all of those bureaucratic channels, um, what it is spent on, I think that is where we are actually lacking in that decision-making, Nick. Yeah, you know, so so I went to an IB school and I <laughs> I always kind of got the impression that after a certain point, the 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 a certain, you know, after a certain level, the fees are really actually kind of just paying for some of the extras. You know, the gigantic sports fields, the uh, mm. astro turfs, the swimming pools, the what, 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 what. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, when it comes to the actual education, uh, you don't actually need to be one of the top schools in the country to get as, as Morris pointed out with some of those Model C schools, some really good results. It's also worth, worth remembering um, that in the IB system, there is choice. Parents um, at this level can choose where to send their kids and there's lots of options. There's the Kiro schools, there's like the Crawford stuff, there's there's there's, um, there's the old boarding houses like St. Stidian, St. John's, St. Mike, Michael House, um, Hilton, those places if you're very wealthy. 
And that really does create this competitive market where every single school is offering a certain culture, a certain uh, way of doing things. And um, th that means that ultimately the student benefits. And I think the question is that the IRR has always posed is why can't we do that for South Africa's poor? And that's exactly what our school vouchers idea is about. It's about the government saying, okay, here's a voucher. You can send your kid to whichever school uh, you want, basically, that this voucher can pay for. Um, and you have the decision as a parent where to where to take your kid uh, in much more, much more than you currently do. And I think that could really open up so many opportunities for South Africa's parents to make sure that their kids got the education they deserved and also open up a big new space in private education, which as countries like India have shown is not a preserve of the rich. You can make low cost, affordable, quality private education. Morris, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, yeah, just two points. Also, just, just want to uh, also emphasize that this obviously uh, talking about these various schools is a bit of generalization. You obviously, there are schools in you know, old townships for a better uh, you know, term where you also get excellent results. You get 100% you know, pass rates, sometimes up to close to 100% university entrance rates. And often, you know, you'll sometimes these schools will be featured in the newspaper or whatever. And often comes down to a principal who's really dedicated, make sure teachers are there on time make sure they work hard, making sure they're there every day. It is discipline for the kids. You know, kids have to be there at 8 or 7.30, whatever the case is. Don't allow things like, you know, the uniform strict. Don't allow kids to get away with things like smoking. So I think, you know, there's lots of different moving parts of these kinds of things. And just what um, also what Sholin said, where instead of looking what, uh, uh, when looking at schools that have done well, people argue and say, well, you know, we must bring, that they're basically saying must bring schools that are doing well down to the level of, where schools where and that's a big problem in, in South Africa. I think people they want to it's a kind of a tall poppy syndrome. And I mean it's a bit of a, a tight thing to say, but you can't strengthen the weak by weakening the strong. And I think what the emphasis should be is on bringing up standards rather than trying to lower standards. And we should, you know, any kid in whatever part of South Africa should be able to go to obviously not everybody's going to be able to go to St. John's or Michael House, but every kid in South Africa should be able to have the option to go to a school where they uh, their teachers, there's a dedicated principal that can play sports if they want to. And I think, you know, just to be able to get a good level of education that, you know, gives you a decent start in life. And unfortunately, I think there are too many kids in South Africa who don't even have that option. They, you know, they don't even get that the option to have a decent start at, at the school level. And I think that has lots of consequences for those individuals and for South Africa as a whole. Oh, definitely. Um, the quality of South Africa's education, I think, has been one of the biggest uh, it's one of the worst things that our, 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 the current ANC government has done is that it has, has uh, hollowed out the, or at least failed to improve the education for so many millions of South Africans who have gone out through the schooling system having learned very little. Um, and that's going to create social problems, which we will be dealing with for many, many years after the ANC government is gone. But speaking of social problems and uh, government policy that totally backfired, uh, let's talk a little bit about China and its population. So... Um, some news came out, I believe it was either today or yesterday, that for the first time uh, since 1961, China's population has fallen. It fell, um, it's, it's currently at 1.4118 billion, and it fell by 850,000 people from 2021. So Can't China's you read up the whole number without saying the billion, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> So, do, do a Jacob Zuma, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 169. <laughs> Listen properly. Um, <laughs> so China's birth rate, is, it's been going down for a long time. In 1979, they introduced this thing called the one-child policy, which is, I think, one of the most horrific um, long-term policies that's ever been introduced in, in sort of world history. It resulted in all sorts of horrific abuses of the Chinese population, up to including, you know, I mean, apart from the fact that you were fined for having more than one child without a license. Uh, there have been cases of people who were forced to get abortions. There were cases of people killing their child because they weren't the gender that they wanted. It was an absolute nightmare. And uh, it seems as though um, it has caused significant damage to the demographics of China, which is now sitting with a population that is getting pretty old pretty quickly. Uh, there have been attempts, I think, since the mid-2010s, I think somewhere around 2014, when they repealed the one-child policy to actually boost the birth rate to make up for this uh, problem, but it really doesn't seem to have worked. 
China's birth rate is 6.7 per thousand people, which is much lower than even other countries that have declining birth rates, such as the United States with 11 uh, births per thousand people and the United Kingdom with 10 births per thousand people. Um, and India, which is very likely, uh, I think this year, to overtake China as the most populous country in the world, has a birth rate of 16 per thousand people. Uh, so China is, I think, about to suffer a very serious demographic problem where, um, as, as the trite saying that people have been throwing around goes, they may run the risk of growing old before they grow truly wealthy. Um, Sholem, I think... You know, there's been a lot of talk, particularly in the last 10 years, about the rise of China and the Chinese century and how China is set to take over world leadership in terms of economics. This may cause some problems. What do you think? I definitely think um, it will cause some problems, Nick. I mean, having a large population is probably one of China's um, selling points, um, mainly because, you know, I'm no um, special economist or anything, but it's, it, it's easy to understand that having a large population means that there are potentially more people who can be productive um, and actually work and actually contribute to the economy, more people to buy and sell and more people to produce. produce I mean, China, this definitely is China as a manufacturing hub because that's what they basically tell all of these um, international corporations and companies like you can come over here, we will build your products, we will make them, um, we will do it for cheaper and we have more labor. Um, and I mean, that's such a um, good selling point to have. And now that that is actually going against them um, because of the policies um, like the one child policy thing. And I mean, it's just a clear illustration of government overreach. Um, you know, government should have no place at all to tell any individual um, how many kids um, they should be having and how many kids they shouldn't um, be mandating things like that. Um, I think that is complete overreach. And just with like broadly speaking, um, Nick, like internationally, I think China finds itself in a difficult situation. I mean, finally, we are starting to see the United States, um, the European Union, um, Japan, Australia, all of these sort of adversaries of China starting to finally take a, a much more stronger stance, um, whether it's tough, or, tough enough or not. Um, against China, that's occurring. Um, we're seeing um, probably who I think is China's best um, geopolitical asset, um, Russia, is currently failing um, in, in, a, in its war and is struggling against a country like Ukraine. Um, I mean, it's harming the Chinese image if that's the country they wanted as the partner against the West. Um, we're also seeing companies like Apple who are now finally deciding, you know what, um, we've seen things with how China handled um, the COVID lockdown, um, some of the policies, and now these kind, now these companies are starting to bet on India instead, um, going to somebody who's also starting to be um, uh, an, an opponent to China, especially wanting people to come and wanting to be a manufacturing hub. I think a combination of all of these things um, makes it a really difficult um, situation with China to be in, especially since everybody has this image that China is going to be um, smooth sailing um, towards this dominant power, you know, becoming the superpower, overtaking um, the, some of those in the West. Um, I do think this um, it, it hinders their progress a bit, but I would caution against being like, okay, no, finally, this is the final coffin in China's um um, yeah, final nail in China's coffin. I think that is definitely not the case. Um, I think they still probably have a lot of fight in, in them. And I'm sure some people, some opponents of these are definitely thinking, okay, this is actually a good thing. Um, but I, I wouldn't count against the Chinese, I think, Nick. And Morris, it's quite interesting because I think while China seems to be aging at, at a faster rate than a lot of other countries because of how low its birth rate is, they're... Um, this is not a unique problem to them, right? Uh, we've seen, especially in Europe, um, this problem where, and, and to some degree, even places like the United States, these old welfare systems which promised pensions and generous benefits for people, they were always based on the assumption that there would be a growing population with new young people coming in who would be able to pay the taxes that would feed these systems. Uh, and now the population gets older and older. That means you have to spend more on healthcare. It means you have to spend more of your government budget on pensions. It means that people aren't necessarily as productive overall. And you really begin to realize that the great problem perhaps of the 21st century is not too many people, but too few. Um, what do you make of all this, Morris? 
Yeah, well, uh, the benefit that uh, a lot of countries in Western Europe and uh, the US and say Australia has is they are places where migrants want to go and they are fairly accepting of migrants. So uh, while they have fairly low birth rates, uh, a lot of that is supplemented by people coming from other places, come to live and work there. Uh, but people obviously don't really migrate to somewhere like China and the other places that are, have the same problem as China, Japan and South Korea. Uh, while they're obviously much more free and open societies than uh, China, they're also fairly hostile to migrants. It's uh, very hard to uh, become a citizen of Japan if you aren't uh, from, uh, if you know, if you're not an ethnic Japanese person. I think South Korea is fairly similar. So they have huge problems. I mean, South Korea has got the lowest birth rate in the world at the moment, and they're going to see huge population crashes by the middle of the century, Japan, South Korea. And uh, even I think Russia's also got some similar problems. Its population is also busy shrinking and probably even worse now with people. There are very few countries outside of Africa that aren't kind of facing the similar problem. Exactly. And uh, yeah, so um, that's an issue. And uh, while I still think it's going to be Asia century, it's probably going to be India century. And uh, there's some speculation that India is probably already actually the most populous uh, country in the world. Uh, some people think that uh, India actually already overtook uh, China sometime last year. And uh, another um, uh, consequence of the one child policy is, uh, as you said, people were, uh, were aborting fetuses and whatever because of the wrong gender. They were generally aborting uh, girl babies because, you know, for better or worse, in a lot of cultures, it's seen as better to have a, a, a male, uh, male as a baby, especially if you can only have one kid to carry on the family name and be the heir and all, all that kind of thing. So what's resulted is there are far more uh, Chinese men than Chinese women. And, you know, and it's a fact of nature across the world. Single men with uh, not much to do uh, generally get up to nonsense. If they've got a, uh, you know, a wife to go back to and a family to take care of, they generally become more responsible. They don't cause trouble. You know, and uh, China that uh, we don't, uh, they obviously there's, I don't know the exact number, but I read, you know, I'm open to correction, but it could be something like 100 to 200 million surplus men. And, you know, that also causes social problems, you know, these people also feel uh, lonely and all kinds of other issues. And this is issue, something that's also actually a problem in parts of Africa where still uh, people can have uh, more than one wife. And uh, then also same thing, same kind of thing happens. Men don't have a, a partner and whatever you, you know, what happens, they join gangs or militias and all that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, maybe that could be a uh, possibility in China. So, you know, lots of uh, unintended consequences for China. And I think same thing, um, People are uh, having a child in China is also pretty expensive. And I think social norms have maybe changed now where people got used to only having one kid. And so people are happy now to, you know, women especially have probably more options also to for education and employment are happy to wait until they're, you know, early or mid thirties to, because they know they're only going to have one child. So they don't really have to worry too much about problems of getting old. And one, you know, if you have your first kid at 36 or 37, you're not going to have six more most probably. You know, so I think that's also a problem. And yeah, uh, there have been some incentives. I know one uh, city in China, I think it's Shenzhou, they suggested giving people a, a kind of a bonus uh, each year in the first four ki- four years of a child's life was the couple's third child. But apparently there hasn't been much uh, uh, uptake for that because so few people are having more than two kids at the moment. So yeah, so China's got some big problems. Uh, you know, I think uh, we can obviously you can't see the future, but I think, yeah, uh, I'm not sure how China's going to get out of this. And, you know, sometimes what happens when to distract from problems at home, then uh, often countries look abroad to cause trouble. So I think uh, the Taiwanese are probably looking across the Taiwan Strait, uh, you know, with a bit of trepidation, especially what's going to happen over the next five years or the next decade or so. Yeah, population growth in, in at least my very not expert opinion is a pretty... Um, important part of sort of sustainable long-term growth. And I think Japan is a really great example of how, you know, getting old very quickly is not great for your economy. Japan has really struggled to recover ever since its demographics really began to dip, I think, in the 90s. Um, and, and also, also I mean, was, I was going, and Japan didn't uh, ever have a thing like a one-child policy. And they've also yeah. seen more than South Korea. Yeah. And they've, they, so yeah, there's some, there's some deeper underlying issues, I think, in those countries too, where we've mm. seen these kind of things. So I see um, Chris in the comments mentions that Hungary is a better model. I think, I haven't read a huge amount about it, but I'm pretty sure that even Hungary's attempts to boost its birth rate have not actually been particularly successful. Uh, So this is a policy problem that I don't think anyone has actually figured out the answer to. Um, And it's something that I think will consume quite a lot of intellectual energy in the decades ahead. Okay. Um, 
we don't have a huge amount of time left, so let's just quickly move on to our next story. Um, and I don't know how much we have to say about this, but I think it's probably worth mentioning that uh, our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, has called for caution in how the electricity tariff hike is applied to South Africa. Uh, so as I'm sure everyone knows, the electricity tariff is being raised by 18.65%. There's a lot to try and rescue ESCOM's terrible financial position. And Ramaphosa has uh, been quick to say that he is, quote, deeply concerned about the increase and that he feels the pain of customers who now have to pay more for electricity. Um, a spokesperson for him said, quote, while the president appreciates fully that ESCOM needs additional funding, he is equally sympathetic to the anger and frustration that is being felt by customers and households with regard to paying more, more for power that is intermittent. Therefore, it is vital that ESCOM and municipalities consider a balance that needs to be maintained in the application of the tariff increase. Households are already reeling under the high cost of living. Electricity costs need to match the availability of megawatts and the electricity that people are receiving. Huh. So is he for the tariff or against it, Morris? I think it's typical uh, kind of double speak from the president. He says a lot of words to say absolutely nothing. And you know, he's like tries to keep both sides happy and ends up keeping nobody happy. And it's typical from the president. <laughs> I don't think anybody's surprised. Like I say, is he for the tariff? Is he against it? Who knows? You know, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, not even willing Sherlin to defend his own policy here particularly. Because uh, this is his government's policy. They're totally behind it. Mm -hmm. He even says that he sees the need for it, but he can't go out and defend it properly. Yeah, no, for sure. As Marius has mentioned, I think Ramaphosa has this tendency, you know, he arrives at the crime scene and is baffled by what has occurred. Um, he's always surprised and shocked, um, as if though he was not um, in this government for how many years since Jacob Zuma's. Um, tenure and i mean even ramaphosa he was placed as uh when he was deputy president uh, ramaphosa was given this war room you know that they proudly so um boldly stated yeah. and bragged about um, We're, what eight years into the ramaphosa recovery of escom when he had to turn around he was in charge of the turnaround right <laughs> sure and i mean he had an entire war room to solve this um escom's challenges and yet he is shocked by what is occurring right now and yeah, even in the article, he makes this statement that, you know what, ESCOM is, um, it's too big to fail. And I see, and I think that's exactly the problem. It's, it is too big and it is already failing. Um, I don't know, somebody really needs to wake up uh, and oppose it to what's actually occurring. And especially this whole speak um, or this PR stunt, whatever you like to call it, um, is where he's trying to relate to the common individual experiencing load shedding, yet we know that his ministers, um, these high officials in government, they do not even pay for, um, for, for the electricity. They are completely withdrawn from anything that we experience, such as load shedding. Um, so for him to try and relate to South Africans' um, struggle, it's just not working, in my opinion, Nick. Yeah, I know it's... It's poor. It's poor. But anyway. Okay. Um, just to say, tell an old joke, yeah, um, Cyril can't be shocked because there's no electricity in the country. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the, uh, the one of the very first uh, load shedding jokes from very early in, in when load shedding began, which is, um, uh, what did we have before candles? Yeah, electricity. Electricity. Anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of load shedding, let's very quickly breeze over our last story. Uh, Joburg and Swane have seen the rise of usually homeless people directing traffic as unofficial pointsmen. And now the Johannesburg Metro Police and to some degree the Twine Metro Police have decided they're going to crack down on uh, these people saying that um, there's no liability for the city when they direct traffic. These guys aren't trained and they are a danger to public um, uh, participation. I, what was interesting though was I saw, I think Times Live had a poll about whether people thought that uh, homeless people directing traffic was a good or a bad thing. And a majority, I think it was 52% or something, said that it was a good thing. And uh, 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 some said it would be a good thing if they were trained, which is what Twine says that they plan to do. Very briefly, Morris, this is a symptom of kind of state collapse. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, people, what do you think? What, what are people filling the gap with the states left? But also, I mean, Good for these homeless people, but they shouldn't be doing this job. I mean, number one, they should be working traffic lights. Number two, when there isn't, they should be, 
you know, traffic police doing this kind of thing. And also, why should the why China shouldn't be training homeless people? Their police officers should be there manning the traffic lights to make sure that traffic's working. And failing that, the traffic lights should be working. So it's all, yeah, it's, I mean, it's typical uh, yeah, South Africa. <laughs> Charlotte, anything to add just to finish? <laughs> yeah, no, Nick, I just think that the argument um, is being missed um, by them regarding, regarding why homeless people are there in the first place. I think um, it's abnormal for us to not have electricity in the first place. I think it's become, it's become so normalized that we are looking for solutions, um, you know, to, to, to merely subdue it and not to fix it. Um, I think this is merely a symptom of the underlying problem. And I would much more encourage the government, the municipality to focus on actually providing electricity. Um, and you would not have this problem in the first place, Nick. Indeed. All right. Um, with that, let's close up for today. Thank you very much for listening. Please like the show, subscribe to us if you haven't already. Uh, and please rate us highly on the podcast apps. And we'll see you tomorrow on the Daily Print Show. Cheers, everyone.